Okay, folks, let's dive in quickly. I'm getting my microphone thing put together here, and here we go. Uh, still setting up. So it's Carl, your buddy, for the daily Bible reading. Let's hit it, and it, uh, yeah, we are in November the 5th. November 5th of 2020 is a Thursday. How about that? So be praying for the nation. November 5th of 2020. We'll see what uh, is going on in the world. We just finished our presidential election and nobody really knows here. I'm recording this on the 4th, so election Tuesday was the 3rd. We're having the well on the 4th, but I'm recording this for the 5th at, at post. That way I'm getting the midnight posting. And uh, there you go. Stay in prayer, stay in peace. No matter who wins, God is ultimately in control. But we demand a lot from our leaders as a nation, as any nation should, and they should serve the people and the will of the people, for the most part. And uh, I think the the amazing thing, looking at the bigger picture, it's amazing how different we are as a country. I mean, we are vastly opinionated on all sides of the issues, and it's amazing to see um, in this election, how fine of a line it is between, you know, of the left and the right and people in the middle. There you go. So the church should be engaged first and foremost in honoring authority, blessing and praying and lifting people up before the Lord so that they are convicted to make, make righteous decisions. Scriptures say righteousness exalts a nation, not people, not, you know, Blessed is the nation who, who the Lord is their God. So are we a theocracy? Do we run like the old tribes of Israel where, you know, it was kind of a theocracy, really? No, we don't do that, not in this age or dispensation. And nobody would really want that. And yet Judeo-Christian principles usually set things in order rather well you know, even with our flaws. So it'd be interesting to see what would happen to a truly ungodly secular society. I don't think anybody wants that either. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say. So we're praying for the nation. We still don't know on this Thursday. We might know <laughs> by the time this gets posted on Thursday, we might know something. All right, bless you all. Let's do the daily reading and see how God dealt with people through the ages and what our place is in Christ. November 5th, Ezekiel chapter 12, all the way through chapter 14, verse 11. And here we go. Signs of the coming exile. Again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, you live among rebels who have eyes but refuse to see. They have ears but refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious people. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Life is biblical. Times don't change. People come and go. They draw near to God. They go away from God and, um, and they serve other gods. And there's only one God. Look, God's people, even God's people in old covenant time strayed. So sad. All right. Verse three. So now son of man, pretend you are being sent into exile, pack the few items an exile could carry and leave your home to go somewhere else. Do this right in front of the people so they can see you, for perhaps they will pay attention to this, even though they are such rebels. Bring your baggage outside during the day so they can watch you. Then in the evening, as they are watching, leave your house as captives do when they begin a long march to distant lands. Dig a hole through the wall while they are watching and go out through it. As they watch, lift your pack to your shoulders and walk away into the night. Cover your face so you cannot see the land you are leaving. For I have made you a sign for the people of Israel. So I did as I was told. In broad daylight, I brought my pack outside filled with the things I might carry into exile. Then in the evening, while the people looked on, I dug through the wall with my hands and went out into the night with my pack on my shoulder. The next morning, this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man... These rebels, the people of Israel, have asked you what all this means. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. These actions contain a message for King Zedekiah in Jerusalem 
and for all the people of Israel. Explain that your actions are a sign to show what will soon happen to them, for they will be driven into exile as captives. Even Zedekiah will leave Jerusalem at night through a hole in the wall, taking only what he can carry with him. He will cover his face and his eyes will not see the land he is leaving. Then I will throw my net over him and capture him in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Babylonians, though he will never see it, and he will die there. Wow, Lord, I will scatter his servants and warriors to the four winds and send the sword after them. And when I scatter them among the nations, they will know that I am the Lord. But I will spare a few of them from death by war, famine, or disease, so they can confess all their detestable sins to their captors. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Get that. God's going to have them confess even their sins to the people that are capturing them. Excuse me. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, tremble as you eat your food. Shake with fear as you drink your water. Tell the people, this is what the sovereign Lord says concerning those living in Israel and Jerusalem. They will eat their food with trembling and sip their water in despair. For their land will be stripped bare because of their violence. The cities will be destroyed and the farmland made desolate. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 21. Again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, you've heard that proverb they quote in Israel. Time passes and prophecies come to nothing. Tell the people, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will put an end to this proverb and you will soon stop quoting it. Hmm. Now give them this new proverb to replace the old one. The time has come for every prophecy to be fulfilled. Wow, look at that, because these prophets are speaking the voice of God, first and foremost. Side note about prophecies, pointing to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus Christ fulfilled every Messiah prophecy throughout Scripture? astronomically impossible, mathematically impossible. The, the chances you can't, Jesus couldn't have made that up. So when people say some more validity about Jesus, well, Jesus fulfilled every messianic prophecy in scripture about that. Awesome. It's over 330, I think, Some something amazing. And just to get like a handful correct <laughs> would be mathematically, you know, outrageous. So imagine Every prophecy about the Messiah coming is fulfilled by Jesus. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. All right, moving on, but this is con concerning other prophecies. Verse 24, there will be no more false visions and flattering predictions in Israel, for I am the Lord. If I say it, it will happen. There will be no more delays, you rebels of Israel. I will fulfill my threat of destruction in your own lifetime. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the people of Israel are saying, he's talking about the distant future. His visions won't come true for a long, long time. <clears throat> Therefore, tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. No more delay. I will now do everything I have threatened. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. So God's saying, <coughs> right now, all this judgment, exile, etc. is going to happen. Wow, chapter 13 of Ezekiel, judgment against false prophets. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, prophesy against the false prophets of Israel who are inventing their own prophecies. Say to them, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. What sorrow awaits the false prophets who are following their own imaginations and have seen nothing at all. O oh, people of Israel, these prophets of yours are like jackals digging in the ruins. They have done nothing to repair the breaks in the walls around the nation. They have not helped it to stand firm in battle on the day of the Lord. Instead, they have told lies and made false predictions. They say, this message is from the Lord. Even the Lord, wow, this message is from the Lord, even though the Lord never sent them. And yet they expect him to fulfill their prophecies. Can your visions be anything but false if you claim 
this message is from the Lord when I have not even spoken it to you? Well, no, they can't claim that. They're guessing, right? Man, so if you're going to prophesy, you're gonna, you think you're getting, a, getting a, <clears throat> a prophecy, test it. Moving on, verse 8. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because of what you say is false and your visions are a lie, I will stand against you, says the Lord. I will raise my fist against all the prophets who see false visions and make lying predictions, and they will be banished from the community of Israel. I will blot their names from Israel's record books, and they will never again set foot in their own land. Then you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. This will happen because these evil prophets deceive my people by saying, All is peaceful when there is no peace at all. It's as if the people have built a flimsy wall and these prophets are trying to reinforce it by covering it with whitewash. Tell these whitewashers that their wall will soon fall down. A heavy rainstorm will undermine it. Great hailstones and mighty winds will knock it down. And when the wall, wall falls, the people will cry out, What happened to your whitewash? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will sweep away your whitewashed wall with a storm of indignation, with a great flood of anger, with hailstones of fury. I will break down your wall right to its foundation, and when it falls, it will crush you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. At last, my anger against the wall and those who covered it with whitewash will be satisfied. Then I will say to you, the wall and those who whitewashed it are both gone. <clears throat> There, they were lying prophets who claimed peace would come to Jerusalem when there was no peace. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Judgment against false women prophets. So there can be men and women prophets. It doesn't matter gender. And there can be true prophets and false prophets. And we just have to discern it, especially in the Old Testament they were dealing with it. And there's still prophetic people in our day. The, vo the gifts of Prophecy are a church gift. The fivefold ministry in the New Covenant is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. That's the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastors, teachers. I kind of see them that way. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on. Well, the scripture says that, but I do these first three. Ape. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. And then in the church, there's also the teachers and pastors. <clears throat> That's why I say that like that. All right, I'm moving on. Now, son of man, speak out against the women who prophesy from their own imagination. Sorry, y'all. I, I, I was out working in the dust, and I got dust in my pipe. So, ah, a little a lubrication for the vocal cords. <clears throat> in fact, I think I feel the mud washing down my gullet. <laughs> Mm. All right, here we go. And now, son of man, speak out against the women who prophesy from their own imaginations. That's what we don't want to do. I don't want to bring a word and go, uh, thus say, no, you may say, well, I feel this or I think this. People have said that, even the Apostle Paul. Well, this isn't from the Lord, but I, Paul, feel this way. He would say things like that. And we can speak like according to our best judgment. But that's not a prophecy or a word from the Lord. So here we go. Their own imaginations, right? Verse 18, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. What sorrow awaits you women who are ensnaring the souls of my people, young and old alike. You tie magic charms on their wrist and furnish them with magic veils. Do you think you can trap others without bringing destruction on yourselves? You bring shame on me. Among my people, for a few handfuls of barley or a piece of bread. Wow, Lord. By lying to my people who love to listen to lies, you kill those who should not die, and you promise life to those who should not live. Wow. Verse 20. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against all your magic charms which you use to ensnare my people like birds. I will tear them from your arms, setting my people free, <clears throat> free like birds set free from a cage. I will tear off the magic veils and save my people from, from your grasp. They will no longer be your victims. Then you will know that I am the Lord. You have discouraged the righteous with your lies. 
but I didn't want them to be sad. And you have encouraged the wicked by promising them life, even though they continue in their sins. Wow, because of all this, you will no longer talk of seeing visions that you never saw, nor will you make predictions, for I will rescue my people from your grasp. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Yes, Lord. Verse 14 the idolatry of Israel's leaders. Here we go. I'm sorry, chapter 14 of Ezekiel, and we'll go up to verse 11 as the daily reading once. Then some of the leaders of Israel visited me, and while they were sitting with me, this message came to me from the Lord, Son of Man. These leaders have set up idols in their hearts. They have embraced things that will make them fall into sin. Why should I listen to their request? Tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. The people of Israel have set up idols in their hearts and fallen into sin. Idols in their hearts. That phrasing, folks, that's interesting to get. we got to guard our hearts from deception. Idolatry in our heart towards stuff, things, people, anything that's, that, that overshadows our attention to the Lord our love for God, or we think we don't need to hear from the Lord or that there's something bigger than God. And you set up an idol in your heart and we, it causes us to fall into sin, right? And then they go to a prophet asking for a message. So the, I, the Lord, will give him the kind of answer that great idolatry deserves. Verse five, I will do this to capture their mind. I'm sorry, I will do this to capture the minds and hearts of all my people who have turned from me to worship their detestable idols. So God's going to try to reach back to them. Verse 6, Therefore tell the people of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Repent and turn away from your idols and stop all your detestable sins. I, the Lord, will answer all those, both Israelites and foreigners, who reject me and set up idols in their hearts and so fall into sin, and who then come to a prophet asking for my advice. I will turn against such people and make a terrible example of them, eliminating them from among my people. Then you, then you will know that I am the Lord. <clears throat> wow, Lord. Verse 9, And if a prophet is deceived into giving a message, it is because I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Wow. I will lift my fist against such prophets and cut them off from the community of Israel. False prophets and those who seek their guidance will all be punished for their sins. In this way, the people of Israel will learn not to stray from me, polluting themselves with sin. They will be my people and I will be their God. <clears throat> I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. There you go. Still got dust in my throat. All right. November the 5th. The today's psalm, we're going to finish up Psalm 105, a big one. We'll pick it up at 37, <clears throat> where we left off. Here we go. The Lord brought his people out of Egypt, loaded with silver and gold, and not one among the tribes of Israel even stumbled. Egypt was glad when they were gone, for they feared them greatly. The Lord spread a cloud above them as a covering and gave them a great fire to light the darkness. They asked for meat, and he sent them, sent them quail. Hmm. He satisfied their hunger with manna, bread from heaven. Or in actual translation, the word manna is, what is it? <laughs> it was called the bread from heaven, but it wasn't actual bread. They're not sure. There you go. He split open a rock and water gushed out to form a river through the dry wasteland to form a river. Yeah, for he remembered his sacred promise to his servant Abraham. So he brought his people out of Egypt with joy, his chosen ones with rejoicing. He gave his people the lands of pagan nations and they harvested crops that others had planted. All this happened so they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. There you go. So we're done there with 105, and I will move on. Today's proverb on November the 5th is Proverbs 27, verse 3. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but the resentment caused by a fool is even heavier. Wow. 
Now, that's something to chew on. Many times when a proverb is weighty <clears throat> and it's a single quote for the day, I'll do a little more research. Uh, and they don't give us a footnote here on 27.3. We'll let that go. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but the resentment caused by a fool is even heavier. Sometimes, too, when something seems vague, I'll go to another translation. For now, I will move on. Or even look up the original language, like a Greek-Hebrew reference Bible, which is also available. All right, let's move on. No November 5th, for the New Testament reading is chapter 7 of Hebrews, 1 through 17. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. So remember, Jesus is in this order. He's King David's line, right, of the tribes, of all the tribes. But he, his priesthood, his work is, is similar to Melchizedek, right? <clears throat> Let's read chapter 7 of Hebrews. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God, Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it till Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and king of Salem means king of peace. Wow, sound familiar? So Jesus is the ultimate, right, king, ruler, lord, god, and he's in the line of Melchizedek, that priesthood, king of justice, <laughs> king of Salem means king of peace. That's beautiful. Verse 3, there's no record of his father or mother. Or, now that's interesting. Some people have made the comparison that Melchizedek might have been an early manifestation of Jesus. I'm not, uh, I don't know, and I don't really care. And uh, I'm like, that's an interesting comparison. But it makes more sense that he's definitely in that line. But the fact that there's no record of Melchizedek's family. That's curious, right? No record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors. No beginning or end to his life. Ah, he remains a priest forever resembling the son of God. This is Hebrews talking about this. Consider then how the great, how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who were also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God, and without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are, because we are told that he lives on. So see all these references to Jesus. That's why people, you know, consider that, you know, thought of who Melchizedek was. In addition, we might even say that these Levites... The ones who collect the tithe paid a little, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of Levi, in which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. This is big, folks. You can put a note here above this chapter. The priesthood, right? Based on Melchizedek now, not the old order. Wow. And I'm doing that. I've got a lot of marks in this chapter. Verse 12. And if the priesthood is ch changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest or we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priest. What I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, right? And Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Hmm. This change has, has been made very clear since a different priest who was like Melchizedek has appeared. 
who is like Melchizedek has appeared. That's Jesus Christ. He, he has come to us, right? Emmanuel, God with us. He's in this line. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. Wow, this is deep. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, quote, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And I'm going to pause there, although the, the rest of this chapter is going to talk about this whole priestly order of Jesus. Very powerful stuff. This writing in Hebrews has been preached on, taught on. You can research it a lot. This is the priesthood of Jesus to redeem us. That's very awesome. Very powerful. All right, folks, that's it for November the 5th. We'll let it go at that point for the daily reading. We'll see you tomorrow for another one. Bye-bye.